I would like to welcome our distinguished uh, panelists uh, today. Uh, we have uh, three panelists, as you already know, um, Minister of um, Economic and Sustainable uh, Development, uh, Ms. Nadia Turnava, has been called uh, by Prime Minister to attend the 2 p.m. Uh, crisis uh, committee meeting, but she will join us in uh, 10 to 15 minutes and uh, she will uh, stay uh, with us for about half an hour. Um, I also uh, welcome uh, my uh, two uh, former World Bank colleagues, um, the two uh, economists that, uh, that I admire. This is Martin Reiser um, and this is Arup Banerjee. Martin Reiser is the country director uh, of the World Bank for um, uh, China. Uh, Mongolia and Korea and leading one of the largest um, um, investment uh, portfolio, loan portfolios uh, of the World Bank. Uh, he is uh, um, he's a PhD economist. He has doctoral uh, degree from the University of Kiel and uh, a degree in economics and economic uh, history from LSE. He taught, he came uh, to the development uh, work from academia. He worked in EBRD and formerly was a country director for Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Moldova, uh, Turkey and uh, many other uh, very critical positions in the World Bank. Um, Arub Banerjee is the Regional Director for European Union uh, for the World Bank Group. Uh, he oversees the World Bank operations in all EU member countries. Um, formerly, he was a Senior Director for uh, Social Protection and Labour Global Practice of the World Bank and so was direct Senior Director for the Jobs Group. Um, he is a um, PhD economist um, and he holds a PhD in economics from University of Pennsylvania, also worked in academia um, and um, uh, um, both uh, speakers have been very actively publishing uh, uh, um, their research and uh, critical, uh, um, leading a cri critical publications of the World Bank. So with this, um, let me come with the first uh, question to you, uh, Martin, uh, and uh, also Arup, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted to see you both. Uh, we have not seen each other for a long time. Um, so uh, with, um, with the current state, when um, the, the countries, the governments are um, applying measures uh, to, uh, to contain the spread of the virus, and so to gain the health benefits. At the same time, these measures are obviously um, uh, causing very major uh, impacts on economy, and there are um, economic costs. So the key question here is uh, how to minimize economic costs and how to strike a right balance between the measures uh, um, that, um, you know, benefit the health, uh, but at the same time, how to reduce uh, the impact. So my uh, first question would be, how do you see uh, the prospects, and particularly as it relates to the experiences of various countries on, and how the countries you work on um, are um, addressing uh, these issues? And I welcome uh, Minister Nadia Turnawa. I see her joining us, and thank you very much, uh, Minister. So I just posed uh, our first question and um, off to you, Martin and Arup, and then uh, Minister, if you could uh, uh, give us your perspective with the particular outlook uh, for Georgia. Thank you, uh, Tamara. I, I just want to check if you can hear me. Yes, we hear you very can you well. Hear me? Yeah? Yes. Wonderful. We hear you very well. Okay, great. Um, so uh, thank you for this uh, for this opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, I think it's it's good that we uh, uh, you know one of the one of the downsides of um, uh, of this uh, crisis has been that the exchange of ideas that happens uh, by meeting people, by going to conferences, by uh, exchanging views face to face. Uh, has been interrupted. But the good news is that thanks to modern technology, we don't need to stop talking to one another. And so it's uh, it's great that we have this uh, this opportunity. Um, from the from the let me say let me say a few general things and then a couple of reflections on on China to respond to your first question. 
Um, the first thing I would say is that um, I think all around the world, uh, countries have taken the decision uh, to make sure that the public health response receives priority. Um, there are very few countries that have um, uh, you know, consciously tried <clears throat> another strategy. Um, uh, and those that have tried um, have had to uh, change course relatively quickly. And that is because from what we know about this um, uh, pandemic, um, the virus is, is relatively um, uh, aggressive uh, and um, it has the potential of infecting a large um, uh, proportion of the population relatively quickly and sufficiently severely that health systems would be quickly overwhelmed if you tried to mitigate um, rather than to contain. And so once you've taken that decision, you know, in the first a uh, few weeks of, of this, uh, you're obviously stuck with a lock, lockdown and dealing with the, with, with the consequences of the lockdown. And that's what we're seeing in the global forecasts. Um, this is an unprecedentedly coordinated and deep recession. It's different than the global financial crisis in the sense that every region in the world is affected. There is no China that's magically going to pull emerging markets um, out of this by, uh, uh, you know, by, by bucking the trend. Uh, let's remember that China, in the midst of the global financial crisis, very quickly rebounded and, and recorded several years of double-digit growth. Um, that meant that uh, in most of the emerging markets um, the, in 10 years ago, the, the shape was distinctly a V. Um, this time around, uh, China has, uh, uh, you know, is unlikely to experience quite the same uh, pace of rebound. And so we're, we're dealing with a coordinated um, uh, contraction all around the world and a recession, probably in all regions of the world, with the exception um, of Asia. And even in Asia, we're dealing with um, a, a very sharp decline in, in, in growth forecasts. Um, so, you know, given that situation, what can countries, um, uh, what can countries do? Uh, obviously, uh, if, if we take um, as the basis the assumption that this is uh, severe but limited, then the right thing to do is to try and help firms as well as people uh, survive. The traditional recipe that we recommend in a crisis um, is to target our support to those that are most vulnerable um, and to protect um, workers rather than firms uh, and protect workers rather than jobs. But in this particular crisis, uh, we believe that um, a lot of companies that could potentially be, you know, that would be viable concerns under any normal circumstances um, are going to be affected. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, it may make sense for policy uh, to turn conventional wisdom on its head uh, and to basically, you know, provide um, significant amounts of support uh, to everybody um, because everybody is going to be affected and the idea of targeting uh, may not be appropriate. Now, only um, you know, the richest countries can afford to do this indiscriminately. Um, if uh, you're poorer, then you're obviously going to have to make some choices. Uh, and whatever support you provide is going to have to be limited in duration. Um, since we don't know exactly how long this lasts, as a first uh, uh, set of response, it seems appropriate that you try and help everybody as much as you can. But you will need to develop um, policies to, to, to target uh, more effectively. Um, China, just to say a word about this, um, uh, you know, China has, has been, uh, uh, after some initial delays, unfortunately, in the identification um, of, uh, of the virus and, and uh, um, in reacting to it, then reacted very decisively. Um, and uh, there was an almost uh, total lockdown imposed on the country. Um, but it was also quite effective. I think if, if, if China was a little late in uh, surveillance, um, it was quite effective in response. And so outside of the Hubei province, there really hasn't been uh, nearly the same uh, degree of, uh, of infection that we've uh, seen in many other countries. And I think that should be credited. Um, I think the second thing, uh, that is interesting about uh, China's policy response is that they managed throughout this crisis, throughout the lockdown, um, you know, basic services continued to function very effectively. I think that's an important uh, point to note for a lot of emerging markets. Uh, you want to make sure that, you know, the supply of, of food, the, uh, the functioning of sanitation and other services is not interrupted. Uh, 
Um, and that requires a major organizational effort. I think there's much that we can learn from how China uh, managed to make sure that there was always food in the supermarkets, uh, that the trash was, uh, was, uh, was taken out, that basic uh, services continued to function. Um, uh, and uh, obviously China um, had major issues in its health system uh, in Hubei, which was overwhelmed, but in the rest of the country, the health system was able to deal uh, with uh, the epidemic quite effectively. People were isolated, fever clinics were, um, uh, were put in place uh, so that the, the degree uh, to which people um, got infected simply by going to the hospital because of something else um, was limited. Uh, not in Hubei uh, province, but outside of uh, the Hubei province. That was, um, that was done quite effectively. And so again, there's something uh, that one can learn from China. And then finally, uh, you know, China did um, a fairly good job uh, in um, uh, tracking, um, uh, you know, contacts, close contacts of people that were infected, and thereby preventing um, the emergence of clusters of local transmission um, through their public health response. So there's something that can be learned from how China uh, managed this. What we don't know yet is how effective China's policies are going to be during the gradual uh, um, you know, opening up of the economy. Uh, China is now uh, back to, uh, you know, 80, around 80% 80 um, uh, operational capacity, uh, but, but, uh, but is now facing a problem that there is a lack of demand, um, a lack of demand from the global economy and a lack of demand from domestic consumers. Uh, many of the uh, poorest uh, uh, people, the migrant workers, etc., haven't uh, received a lot of income over the past few weeks, and so naturally their consumption has adjusted. Uh, and so there's still, I think, room for more policy response to deal with the demand side. Uh, I think uh, China has dealt quite effectively with the supply side of the recovery, but the demand side still remains outstanding. So let me stop here as a first round and uh, 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 you know, interested to continue the discussion. Thank you. Arup, off to you, but uh, before you start, just to note that we have uh, 244 uh, participants um, in Zoom, and uh, we have uh, 171 for following Facebook Live. So off to you, uh, Arup. Thank you very much, uh, Timar, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Good evening to Martin. Um, it's a pleasure being here. As Martin said, um, it is wonderful even within all this tragedy, to uh, be able to still connect as human being and beings and as thinkers. And uh, I hope that we can, this conversation is one of many others that we'll have. I want to just build, not repeat uh, what uh, Martin said, but build a bit on what he said, and especially looking perhaps um, along the recovery path, and what are the prospects, if you'd like, for recovery. So, I think before we start, I think it is important to clarify that our very, very imperfect understanding of this particular virus and this particular epi epidemiology says something very clear, which is that the lockdown is just a palliative, not a cure. And I think that's where all po policymaking has to start from. Because essentially what the lockdown does, and uh, pardon me for um, using a rather fraught example, it's if somebody is very, very ill, this is an induced coma that you put the economy in. Essentially the induced coma is to make the patient stay stable until such time a cure is found or that the infection or the disease is dealt with. That means that as soon as the lockdown is lifted, if nothing else is done, the disease will come roaring back. And I think that is one of the important things to keep in mind as we think about recovery. Um, past research that has studied in detail the previous epidemics, especially the Spanish flu in the US, there's a big literature on that, shows that, as most of you know, that in many places where there was a lockdown and suppression, there was a second wave. That, that again needed a further lockdown in order to keep the infections under control and to flatten the curve so as health capacity was not overwhelmed. So in some ways, what we have learned, and again, it's a very, very emerging uh, idea, what we are learning from 
countries that have been successful, China, of course, foremost among them, but also Korea, New Zealand, um, some parts of Europe, uh, Germany, for example, and Austria, is that there seem to be five essential things that countries need to do. And my bottom line is that I don't think all countries are doing all five. Um, the lockdown is the first, but then it is widespread testing. And that's where I think countries like Korea, for example, and Taiwan and others have been very good, uh, but not others. Um, the third is contact tracing, as Marshall Martin mentioned. So testing, then tracing the contacts of those. Then the fourth element is isolation. So all those who have been traced to have contact with the infected person are isolated. And of course, the fifth element is treatment of those who are affected. Now, all of these five are happening at different paces and at different levels of intensity across the world. And therefore, this coordinated crisis in terms of impact is having different playouts in different parts of the world in terms of how soon different countries are able to recover from the crisis, lift the lockdown, resume economic activity, and resume demand, which is exactly what Martin did. The second point that I would like to make is really the challenge of the globalized economy and how we actually have in the past considered emergence out of a crisis. Martin talked about China being one of the engines of growth out of the, next, uh, out of the last previous crisis. And this was predicated on two things. One is that it was a sufficiently large systemic country, but also that it had very strong links, trading and otherwise with the rest of the world. Now, the questions for the recovery right now are, is there going to be such a systemic country? Uh, Germany seems to be the only candidate, but it's much smaller than the US or China in terms of leading that sort of global recovery. And secondly, what is going to be the sort of linkages that we'll see? How many of these supply chain linkages will survive? How will travel um, and goods transport change? Will they be affected? And therefore, also the power of these linkages will also change. And therefore, I think one of the things looking forward that seems to be, again, looking through a very, very cloudy crystal ball, that seems to be true is that the global recovery may be for individual countries so-called V-shaped, and I can talk in the next round about what are the conditions that um, may actually help those sorts of uh, recoveries, a sharp recovery, but also that especially emerging and developing countries that depend a lot on the external linkages and external drivers of growth for their own growth are going to be disadvantaged compared to countries that have large domestic demand that they can rely on in this world where there is going to be, as uh, if you've seen the FT interview with President Macron, you'll see that he's talking of reshoring many things um, into, back into France. And that is, in Europe, this is part of the con policy conversation uh, across Europe and many countries. So what happens then is that smaller countries, countries more dependent on the globalized world, are going to have a harder time riding those reins of recovery. And therefore, we'll have to rely much more on domestic uh, factors in order to make sure that the recovery uh, resumes, uh, resumes. I want to end by stating what Martin started with, which is that eventually, the basis for any recovery is going to be protecting lives and livelihoods. And I think, this lockdown and the economic measures that countries are taking, however painful right now, are the right way to make sure that first, that the situation doesn't get out of control, and secondly, that because this affects everyone, that sufficient resources are put there to protect both peoples and firms so that they can be the engine of recovery. I'll stop here.
Thank you, Arup. Um, um, Minister, um, thank you very much once again. We know that um, in uh, parallel to this session, there is a very important uh, meeting with Prime Minister Anti-Crisis uh, Committee meeting, and we appreciate your time. Um, and uh, please, uh, you know, stay with us as long as you can, and we will understand your uh, dilemma and challenge if you need to leave at some point, and you do need, I know. Uh, so, uh, would you reflect from Georgia's perspective? We, we heard uh, from uh, Martin Reiser, from Arup Energy, who, uh, Martin, for instance, highlighting the challenge of um, demand uh, side impacts, right? China recovering. Uh, you know, recovering supply side particularly, but then there is a weaker demand uh, locally and uh, globally. Um, at the same time, Arup highlighted a few important points and um, uh, particularly the challenge of the small countries who are, um, you know, more, more dependent, uh, you know, on, on the regional and uh, global outlook. So uh, could you reflect um, from the Georgia's perspective? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tamar. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we have very important meetings. All meetings these days are very important, I guess. <laughs> but I think uh, it is a it is a, an excellent opportunity for us, and I would like to express my gratitude towards organizers, the International School of Economics at Tbilisi State University, and to Tamar Soluhi in person for this excellent opportunity to exchange our views and recent experience regarding anti-crisis measures. Uh, I think it is especially important as the economic crisis driven by the pandemic is like no other crisis. So I think that uh, this is the overall, overall, let's say, consideration right now. And we as a policy makers have to make, uh, I would say, more intuitive rather than knowledge-based decisions these days. So that's why it is so uh, valuable to hear from other colleagues regarding their thoughts and their, their vision or perspectives. So why this crisis is so different? Firstly, uh, and it was mentioned by both speakers, by Martin, by Arup, the shock is large and associated with the health emergency and related containment measures, which makes our, all our actions and policy uh, actions very uh, controversial, I would say. In normal, regular economic crisis, policymakers try to support economic activity by stimulating aggregate demand, as it was mentioned. That's all, all we know yeah, from theory, from practice, uh, as quickly as possible. But nowadays, the crisis represents the consequence of needed containment measures. This makes stimulating activity more challenging and even counterproductive if, if it is taken too early. So, uh, presumably the pre-crisis, that, that's, that's our observation, the pre-crisis starting position matters for any country. And in this terms, I would like to mention Georgia's, uh, Georgia's let's say, um, uh, situation. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has interrupted uh, Georgia's positive economic trajectory, unfortunately. Uh, you probably know that during 2019, economic growth was quite strong here in Georgia. A real GDP grew by 5.1%, despite some external shocks. Uh, uh, if, let's say, considering this uh, Russian ban of flights, which from today's perspective seems to be just a small, very small issue because it's compared to whatever happens right now. And um, it is also important that um, our current account deficit reached a historic low level of 5.1% of uh, GDP, largely due to strong export performance and subdued import growth, which was quite, quite strong performance. And we expected, of course, a lot from this year of 2020. Uh, what is important, Georgia's economy has proved institutional strengths, uh, macroeconomic stability and resilience to significant economic and financial shocks. And this strong position, of course, helps us so far, uh, helps us a lot to wrap through the you know, lockdown period. Uh, as the pandemic worsens and more and more uh, countries are going into full or partial lockdown, it is already obvious that the world is heading into recession and Georgia is not an exception. And we expect a sharp 
contractions in economic activity during 2020, uh, second and third quarters followed by a gradual recovery, hopefully. Growth is projected at minus 4%, according to IMF's recent estimates. However, the duration, as it was mentioned by you both, uh, and full impact of the pandemic are difficult to quantify. And the path to recovery in Georgia and our key trading partners remain quite uncertain. So coronavirus outbreak negatively affects economy, economy, economy through numerous channels. And the most important channels through which Georgia economy will be affected is tourism and business travel. Uh, of course, it's an overall situation and it's true with respect to many other countries as well. But I would like to say that Georgia in this terms is quite vulnerable because, you know, we were developing more service-based economy uh, these years. Georgia's tourism industry has achieved a remarkable growth over the past decade. Tourism has become the largest component of service exports in the country and around 70% of service exports comes on tourism. In parallel with the rapid development of the tourism industry, the share of tourism in GDP was characterized by a growing trend and economic activity in the hotels and restaurant sector increased significantly. So as a result of pandemic travel restrictions and preventive measures, tourism arrivals and receipts are expected to decline sharply. And this is additional additional issue for us. Besides, global growth slowdown has important negative impact on Georgian export of goods and services, uh, including transportation and transit services. Probably you know that our growth in 2018, 2019 was export driven growth. And this is an additional risk and a challenge for, for us also to be uh, addressed. Uh, we are responding to the COVID-19 outbreak in various ways, trying to mitigate negative economic impact on the pandemic. Uh, first of all, our primary goal is to take effective prevention, prevention measures, preventive measures, and focus on our citizens' health and safety uh, in order to prevent exponential growth rate of infected persons and elevate pressure from healthcare system so that it is able to support increasing number of COVID patients. I will not uh, list all these preventive measures that was taken by Georgia because we uh, didn't avoid, a, it's, a, it's a traditional set, set of measures uh, in order to support social distancing and prevent exponential growth, as I mentioned. On March 21st, uh, state of emergency has been declared, followed by total lockdown of high risk uh, areas, uh, big cities and municipalities. And even before that, Georgia had already adopted significant social preventive measures such as closure of borders, crossing travel ban for foreign visitors, quarantine of mandatory self-isolation for nationals uh, returning to Georgia and so on and so forth. Uh, we um, uh, shut down schools, universities, and the uh, majority of business entities, uh, with some, of course, with some exemptions. However, essential economic activities such as utility supply, food delivery, agricultural activities, banking services, and some others may still be carried out in accordance with recommendations issued by Ministry of Health Care. Uh, but the majority of business activities are stopped. And now uh, we, uh, I would say, we have to split our further policy measures on two stages. One is still, let's say, mitigation of immediate, immediate um, negative impact uh, on the population and uh, affected businesses. And the next stage is uh, preparation for uh, for further stimulation and development of the business. So uh, coming back to your question, in order to mitigate the negative impact of the pandemic, we need to weaken the impact of the shocks on the most exposed households and businesses, first of all. Uh, simultaneously, we should continue building strong economic foundations for structural advancement of our economy and uh, boosting economic recovery process once it would be possible. And we do hope that uh, hopefully from the mid uh, May we will be able to implement a gradual lockout, lockout plan. Uh, 
Uh, in parallel with short-term policy measures, we should ensure medium and long-term policy responses, uh, elaborate structural reforms and instruments for boosting economic recovery in future. Like many other countries, we consider more support for domestic production these days and local industries such as food production, agriculture, uh, further support of innovation and technologies to support this distance, distance, uh, let's say, mode of uh, doing business. Uh, actions oriented on the utilization of new opportunities and new economic activities, considering the global trends of diversification and uh, geographical shifts that are expected. The first phase of negotiations with the international financial institutions and donors organizations has been successfully completed. And I would like to underline the importance of these successful, uh, successful uh, negotiations. As a result, additional 1.5 billion US dollars will be available to Georgian economy. By the end of this year, it's immediate support. Besides, about 200 million USD will become available immediately in the next months to the budget to help Georgia to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic according to International Monetary Fund decision. And I would like to underline the importance of this immediate and strong support that was let's say, provided by a donors community, which is uh, quite important these days when the whole globe faced with uh, such a big challenge. And now once we secured the financing, we can speak about more, let's say, uh, active measures. Uh, significant measures are already taken and more are under elaboration to minimize economic costs and support business sector activities, especially SMEs to overcome crisis period. Uh, medium term plan is to open up economy and production as fast as possible, of course, and strengthen our competitiveness on the global arena. Uh, state support programs will become more targeted, to be more specific. We, uh, we are reshaping all our state support programs to SME and business sector and uh, make them more oriented at most vulnerable and affected economic uh, areas, economic sectors, including tourism, of course. State support programs such as micro and small business grants programs, subsidization of commercial loans interest rate for SMEs that was introduced five years ago and worked quite successfully. Uh, So-called credit guarantee scheme, which offers co-collateral for better access to bank finance, uh, will be redesigned in order to easy, to easy pressure from the crisis on business sector and society, in particular to address the shortage of short-term liquidity issue, increase support for the agricultural sector uh, also will be very uh, important and will be considered. Uh, besides, additional components will be provided uh, for the support of domestic production, as I already mentioned. In order to support private sector development and their recovery under the framework of post-crisis comprehensive plan, special emphasis will be given to credit guarantee schemes, as I already mentioned, amongst other important stimulus. Under the credit guarantee scheme, uh, SMEs who have been affected and have high potential of fast uh, post-crisis recovery will be financed. The scheme will also cover restructuring loans, so we redesigned it because before it was just oriented on the future and development programs. Right now it will be addressed also, uh, it will be used also for uh, restructuring of the current loans provided by uh, commercial banks to the SME sector and loans for working capital, immediate uh, loans to cover the gap of working capital. Current, uh, guarantee coverage cap, portfolio cap, guarantee fee and loan amount will be adjusted also accordingly and tailored to ensure maximum absorption and efficiency of the scheme. Uh, credit guarantee schemes represent the one of the most common and efficient tools adopted by countries uh, uh, within the framework of post-COVID economic recovery measures, as it ensures risk sharing among government, commercial banks, and business sector, and is considered as a con uh, counter-cyclical policy tool for SME financing. Uh, to this end, government will implement FDI reallocation grant program because we do, we, uh, do expect a lot of, let's say, 
uh, new plans that are coming from the global uh, global uh, companies and uh, corporations uh, who are seeking uh, reallocate existing businesses by financing workforce. We will finance. We will help them to finance workforce, loading salaries, infrastructural costs, and some risk insurance instruments will be provided. Georgia has been known even before crisis as one of the let's say. Uh, highly attractive platform for doing business and we will elaborate more on that that uh, positions for the companies involved in uh, tourism sphere and related activities such as hotels and restaurants travel agencies transportation companies organizers of cultural and sports events and so on government of georgia will delay property and income taxes for the next four months and more than 18,000 taxpayers and more than 50,000 employees will be affected meaning that more than 100 million georgian lari will remain in the economy through these measures. Uh, in order to minimize the negative impact of pandemic on tourism sector, government developed and launched state support program that envisage co-financing of bank loans interest rate in hotel industry. And within the state support program, more than 2,000 hotels, uh, which is quite high number for Georgia, will be eligible, uh, which experienced a significant financial loss as a result of pandemic. Uh, so, as I already mentioned before, Georgia is actively working with private sector to promote production of products in high demand, such as medical, hygienic, food products, and our support measures will be more oriented on domestic production. Uh, as for the population, and I would like to just to touch upon this issue as well, Georgian government plans uh, to identify everyone who have lost their job in the next upcoming months. And we will then make spe special arrangements to provide them with a direct financial assistance. As well, utility payments for almost two thirds of households will be fully covered by the government for next three months. Uh, impl implemented and planned economic support measures and the realization of structural reforms promise swift post-crisis recovery and we still are stick to that measures. Medium-term growth projections remain unchanged owing to the steadfast implementation of our structural reforms, uh, infrastructure instruments and adequate fiscal and monetary policy and efficient measures oriented on private sector com co competitiveness. However, uh, all of us understand that this positive outlook is fully a subject to efficient response to pandemic, uh, shortening its duration and speedy recovery of not only Georgia, but also the global economy. So that's all in brief I wanted to say. I would like to say also that it's a quite dynamic plan. We are adjusting it absolutely every day. We're trying to learn the best experiences as well as uh, some mistakes uh, done by others uh, to elaborate on that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for this uh, comprehensive um, outline of uh, all measures that the government of Georgia has been taking uh, uh, since the pandemic, uh, you know, um, has been evolving in Georgia as well, uh, but also a future plans, obviously, maintaining macroeconomic stability, supporting businesses and uh, most vulnerable population has been most impacted or um, are the lowest income will be critical and we wish uh, you personally um, 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 success uh, and uh, we all depend uh, on on the steps that uh, will, will be taken and, uh, and we are very much looking forward to seeing um, a, a plan a one cookie and uh, plan of the post-COVID uh, uh, recovery. So we wish you good luck and uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us. We appreciate your time. Um, with, with this, just before I come uh, with a next short question uh, to, uh, to participants, I would like uh, to say that all participants are welcome to post their questions on the Q&A uh, platform. You see uh, the Q&A button. Um, on your screen. So please uh, come with any questions. We hope that we will have last 20 to 25 minutes for Q&A um, session. Um, um, meanwhile, uh, you know, after you all um, spoke, um, dear panelists, I 
I still want to go back and ask uh, perhaps the question for slightly uh, different perspective. Now, some countries started to open up. Uh, Martin, you spoke about China already, and uh, China has resumed uh, its economic operations, and you even mentioned up to 80% of its full capacity. And, um, and we, we also know that a number of European countries are, are opening up. Uh, Germany was uh, planning to open up some small businesses and high schools, uh, I guess, starting uh, from today. Uh, Norway was opening up um, some public spaces, such as parks and, and other public spaces. So um, um, we, we hope that our country that is slightly behind, perhaps in its um, sort of a cycle of um, evolution of uh, pandemic um, and its impact, uh, we, we hope that we will, learning, we will be learning from experience of those countries, what has worked or not, or for instance, uh, Sweden, right, with completely uh, a different uh, kind of approach, what we can all uh, learn uh, from it, and especially that if the second wave uh, will be expected uh, for, for uh, later in the year. So again, just to refer to some of um, IMF um, uh, proposed numbers, yeah, according to IMF, if um, the pandemic uh, will uh, completely slide down and will be gone uh, or settled, defeated, let's put this way, um, um, economies of some countries will be reduced dramatically even in 2021, and according to estimates, U.S. economy uh, may be reduced by 5.9 percent and Africa by 1 percent. Um, and uh, some of the developing countries uh, may be, um, you know, sort of rebounding and going up to increase uh, of 1%, and particularly India is estimated to go with 1.9%. So um, let me revert back uh, to, to the question. What are uh, your views and some of the experiences from the countries you work uh, on um, or that, that are already dealing with... Uh, um, sort of post-COVID or opening up uh, measures. Um, what is the wisdom you could share with us or highlight few of uh, the important matters? So Martin, you first. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Tamara, and thank you, Minister, uh, for a, a very interesting um, description of, of all of the things that uh, the Georgian government uh, is doing. Uh, I think it's a good summary of all of the measures that actually people are thinking about. So uh, you know, there's no there's no mystery here. Um, I think uh, first, let's go back to where we started. Um, as long as um, you're not sure that you know uh, whether you have the risk of secondary outbreaks, so you bring the epidemic under control, but you don't know whether you've achieved herd immunity. Uh, a key measure is going to have to be uh, to put yourself in a position that you know um, uh, when new infections are arise, that you're able to test them quickly, that you're able to track them, uh, uh, including uh, tracing their contacts, isolate and treat those that are infected. If you're not able to do that, it's going to be very difficult for you to achieve sustained economic opening simply because people will be afraid. And, you know, it'll, it'll be hard to force people to go back to work unless you can assure them that you've got the public health situation under control. I mean, it may be, it may be difficult enough to get them to stay home initially, but one of the things that I found what, after I'd locked down my office was it was really hard to convince people to come back to work, even though there hadn't been a single infection in Beijing. People were, were careful for good reason. Now, within this lies also, I think, um, uh, 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 you know, a, uh, a positive perspective in the sense that people's behaviors will adjust even post-crisis, even after the lockdown is lifted. People aren't going to throw themselves into the next football stadium to congregate with as many people as possible. People are going to continue to be cautious. And that opens up an opportunity for policy to open up and allow people to go back to work um, without quite the same degree of tight restrictions that are currently in place. But again, uh, predicated on um, uh, making sure that you've got at least the basic health response, the basic public health surveillance uh, under control. And remember, initially in the first phase of the pandemic, that's difficult because you may have to track, uh, test and trace 
a very, very large number of people. But once the graph has come down, the number of people you need to be able to isolate, you know, is, is considerably less. And so as long as you, your surveillance systems work uh, effectively, and in China that means, for instance, that in any public building, any office building that you enter, when I enter the compound in which I live, my temperature is measured. I'm, my temperature is taken about 10 times a day by various institutions. And in addition, uh, according to health regulations, I ought to be doing it myself uh, at home. I confess I don't always do it uh, twice a day as uh, prescribed. But, but those things have to become routine. Um, and then, you know, you have a good, you have a good handle on um, uh, the risks of secondary outbreaks. Uh, I think it would be good to prepare in time uh, to make sure you've got enough surge capacity in your health systems uh, so that you can react quickly if, that, if the need arises. And then we come to the interesting question of how do you open up? Um, and naturally, you know, we know a little bit about um, uh, the risk factors uh, at this point, but much too, li much too little. We, we, would, we would wish to know a lot more. But assuming that um, we, you know, we have some degree of, of confidence in the numbers that suggest that elderly people or people with um, predetermined health conditions are the people that are most at risk, well, then you can perhaps afford to allow younger people without any um, predetermined health conditions uh, to return to work and concentrate um, some of your protection measures on those groups that are more at risk. You can also, as the Germans are now trying in Munich, uh, uh, you know, do randomized testing so that you get a better sense of what is the demographic profile um, of your population, simply because you, so far you're only testing people that have any symptoms. But if you do randomized testing, you have a better sense of you know, what's the proportion of your population that perhaps already has it. And that gives you important information um, during, the, during the opening up phase. In the case of China, uh, specifically, um, uh, the government has uh, uh, instituted and encouraged enterprises to institute very uh, tight uh, uh, health uh, safety regulations at work. Uh, for instance, uh, service businesses like ours in uh, Beijing um, are uh, discouraged from having more than 50% of their people attending the office at any one time. Uh, we have to keep uh, at least a two meter distance uh, when we when we enter meeting rooms. Uh, we are uh, supposed to wear masks um, uh, whenever we uh, you know uh, go to shops, when we are out on the street, uh, when we enter into our office building. Um, enterprises have stocked up on medical supplies. Everybody has uh, uh, you know a clear game plan of what they do if someone reports a fever or have any kind of symptoms. How are they quickly isolated? What happens to the building? How is it disinfected? Uh, you know what happens to people? Um, uh, you know how they how are they they brought to a hospital um, without the risk uh, of infecting others? Those are all measures that uh, you know you can put in place while you're in a lockdown so that when businesses open up, they know exactly what they're going to do if something happens. And I think the Koreans show how this can be done almost to perfection. I mean, they, they had this all planned before the whole thing happened because of MERS um, and SARS. And so they never had to do the full lockdown because those procedures, the tracking, the testing, the isolating, but also the businesses' procedures on how to deal with this and people's behavior were already adjusted. And that's, I think, one of the secrets of how uh, Korea was able uh, to prevent a complete lockdown, and that uh, conclusion, uh, you know, also holds for countries uh, that are uh, aiming to open up again um, after after a lockdown has taken place. Uh, let me just make a final observation, uh, which is that uh, which is I think relevant uh, in in relation to some of the things that the minister talked about, which is that this crisis is, of course, at the moment a supply and demand crisis, um, and hopefully it's temporary but it will probably also have structural effects. And so, um, uh, you know, it's clear, for instance, in China that e-commerce is booming and that the tendency that we were seeing in the Chinese economy towards digitalization is going to increase. And it may well be that for, you know, a considerable amount of time, uh, people will, will prefer to, 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 take, uh, to take out meals rather than go to restaurants, uh, have food delivered, um, you know, have home entertainment uh, rather than going to the cinemas. Uh, 
um, et cetera, et cetera. But new businesses, new business opportunities are, are, are forming at the same time as, as old ones are breaking away. And in that sense, um, what the minister said about having a good business environment and having flexible labor markets that accommodate that structural change could be quite important. So in the imminent phase of the crisis, as I said earlier, you want to protect workers and firms because you simply, you know, you don't know who's going to survive, who's going to die, and everybody is, is, everybody is similarly affected. But the longer this lasts, the more I think policy needs to be aware of uh, supporting rather than hindering some of the structural changes that are inevitably going to happen as a result of this. Um, and having a policy framework in place that allows you to flexibly adapt to this while you're also putting in place the public health measures and to the extent that you can afford the demand stimulus uh, once the supply restrictions are lifted uh, gives you, I think, uh, uh, you know, a range of, of, of possibilities. But, uh, you know, I say all this from the perspective of countries like China and Korea that have lots and lots of policy space and a lot of administrative capacity. Um, I think the big challenge that we all face in development is how we do this in countries that have lower capacity, um, that have much less policy space, and how we use the limited resources that we as development organizations have to target them to the areas where they're most needed. And I think, uh, to be very honest to you, this is not a question that I feel we have completely resolved. Right now, we're just trying to do as much as we can, um, but it's clearly not, our resources are clearly not sufficient. And so finding ways to prioritize is going to be on the agenda as we go forward. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. A um, um, number of uh, very relevant uh, points uh, for for us, uh, for 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 case of Georgia, but also uh, for a, for a global case. So um, I know that um, a minister has limited time. So perhaps uh, I don't. We will break the sequence, and this time, perhaps would let uh, minister to reflect. Unless you prefer uh, that uh, to to hear what uh, Arup has to say. Minister? Of course, I prefer to hear what Arup Sotso has to say, just to, 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 let's say, hear more, more point of views and very interesting observations. Uh, unfortunately, I have to leave this to very interesting conversation because we have now the next uh, session of discussions also online within the government regarding the economic let's say, uh, lockout, lockout uh, scenarios and the plans, which is quite important. I would like just to make a very brief uh, uh, comment uh, from my side. Also, I think it probably it would be also relevant uh, regarding importance of uh, proper communication these days, because you know the, the 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 role of very let's say sound and proper and the clear communication with the society and especially with the businesses uh, is very high. Uh, for businesses, two things are matters, most of all, predictability and perspective. So we, the government, should give them perspective and should provide uh, at least some, some kind of predictability. Uh, as a Georgian government, we choose this, let's say, a mode of communication. We uh, try to urge our businesses uh, to look at the lockdown from the, let's say, positive side if it's possible, and to use the lockdown period uh, for adaptation, adaptation measures, to prepare themselves to be adopted towards post-COVID uh, era, to be more prepared, to be more safe, to, uh, let's say, introduce at the, at the rule of activities, more, let's say, social distancing, uh, all these uh, safety measures in accordance with the healthcare, uh, the Ministry of Healthcare recommendations like thermal screening, like face masks, like uh, go digital whenever it's uh, possible, switch to distance mode of activities. Uh, and okay, to, just to learn how to live together with the uh, coronavirus because no one knows how long will it last. So that's why we're just uh, uh, asking businesses to be prepared and we are monitoring meanwhile we're using this time this uh, I don't know one month or three weeks or how much will it take just to monitor to help to guide them how to be prepared for this uh, longer journey probably than we expected so that 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 was just a brief comment from from my side how to help businesses to survive psychologically financially economically just 
to uh, use this lockdown period for the preparation, for the reorientation. Uh, so, for, uh, like, uh, to, to, to take all benefits, if possible, from that, that, that uh, breakdown period. Thank you very much. It was very interesting for me, and uh, I'm sorry that I cannot stay longer. And uh, I wish you uh, strongest health and to take the best care of you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Good day. We wish you to stay healthy. Arupov, to you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Minister. It was actually what you said, what uh, the Georgian government is doing now uh, in preparing and communicating are, I think, the core of the story that Martin already told. And that is unfolding, Tamara, as you said, in different ways across Europe. And so in some ways, the European Union and Europe, the European continent is a bit of a laboratory that we all need to watch. Different governments are taking different types of measures with a greater or lesser extent. And frankly, they don't know and we don't know how actually the effects of these will play out over the next weeks and months. So let's take perhaps just a overarching storyline across Europe. The country where I live now, Belgium, has the single highest mortality rate in the world. Um, now, that I'm going to give that as an example, not as a worrisome rate, it's uh, well over 350 per thousand, 35 percent, but because they're counting differently than others. They are counting essentially all presumed deaths from coronavirus as deaths. And this points to one of the uh, key challenges for any country, which is can you test and can you get the data? So Martin spoke about the Munich example and uh, other countries are doing that. Iceland is doing universal testing. Those sorts, if a country has the capacity to fully gauge or a region or a city has the capacity to fully gauge what the extent of the infection is, then the policy instruments can obviously be much more finely tuned. But the reality is that even in a region and countries as wealthy as Europe, with such high capacity, that is not universally applicable. And this is therefore one of the experiments that we have to talk about and think about as if Georgia or any other country has to take examples, because Eventually, uh, I know that many of the conversation are saying, Germany has done this, and shouldn't we all doing that? Sweden has done something else, shouldn't we all be doing that? And the two points to that. One is that each case is specific. So let me just speak about these two examples. What Germany has done across its land, and it's very different, as you know, across Germany, but broadly what it has done is really do the tracing and isolation and uh, treatment parts really, really well. It has high capacity, it has a large number of beds for the infected population. And so what it was able to do is to minimize the number of deaths, which allows it now to gradually, and this is again, not well understood, very, very gradually in inches to open up across the, and in different part, ways across the different land there, across Germany. Sweden is being touted in the media as this country that essentially is all laissez-faire, but that's not actually the case. If you actually know what's going on in Sweden, most people, most people are self-isolating. It is only the exceptions that prove the rule of the people who are not self-isolating and moving the bars. Um, older people are absolutely urged not to leave home and to stay there. There are no gatherings allowed over 50 people. And this is down from 500 earlier. Ski resorts are closed. Um, major resorts are closed. The idea in the Swedish experiment is uh, also an idea in flattening the curve. The idea is a country with a high level of capacity says that it can try and minimize the number of deaths from this while recognizing that there is going to be a trade-off. So one of the thinkers who 
uh, thought about this, talk about the strategy, and I'll perhaps end with that, this and some good practice examples. Each country has a choice of setting the level of its, shall, it, shall we say, the speed limit to prevent traffic accidents. That's a metaphor, right? You can set the speed limit at five kilometers per hour, in which case there'll be very few traffic accidents or none at all. And that will be if you feel that you can't actually save people from traffic accidents. Or you can dial it so that it's at 30 kilometers an hour, not 60 or 100, which means that you're trading these off. But all of this will depend on the capacity of the country and frankly, social tolerance uh, for, and for people obey, obeying the rules by themselves, um, social behavior. So I think that is the experiment that's going on. And my only recommendation to everyone watching and all of us is that we, as Martin says, know very little right now. And so we have to closely watch what's going on. A couple of good practices to end with, Tomas, since you asked. One area in terms of how to, I talked about how to get to a V-shaped curve. Now, there are lots of uncertainty. How do we rebound back? One of the lessons from the last crisis was the program called Hutzabait in Germany, which essentially was um, an unemployment scheme, shall we say, um, that preserved, that allowed firms not to lay off their workers, but with government support, were able to share work among their workers who all work part time, with the government making up part of the difference. Now, this was uh, one of the reasons why Germany was able to bounce back very quickly, because when demand resumed, firms could hire back or employ more, actually, not hire back, but increase the hours that their workers who already knew the system, already knew the firm, or renew the industry, could immediately get production up to speed, and thereby the economy could move back. Such a scheme has now been rolled out across the European Union, um, including in countries like Italy and Spain, um, so that the idea is that as and when things uh, return to normal, um, companies will be able to uh, bounce back. Now, this is very expensive. It is not easy for most countries without the sort of resources that these rich countries have to do it. But the important idea here is um, that uh, for a quick bounce back, we want to not lose the human capital. The last point to end with, and this is, I think, something the minister was very importantly uh, talking about in terms of communication. Effective communication is going to be the cornerstone of all sorts of behavior by human, uh, by people and by firms. And then there, there are ways of framing these ideas um, through the lens of what uh, we call behavioral economics, otherwise called psychology, uh, that can actually make behaviors better. And some countries in uh, Europe are actually working very hard to use these tools in communication. Ireland, the chief among them, who has actually a whole behavioral economics panel to make sure that messages are well understood and well followed, as well as countries like Denmark, who are making their um, online portals much simpler so that uh, companies and people who want to get information or apply for help can do so very quickly. So I can talk more about this, but let me end here because I know there are questions now. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm not going to summarize takeaways right now. Um, I just want to once again thank our participants for staying with us in Zoom, but also on Facebook. And just to mention that um, in, a, in a second, uh, we will have a poll, a very quick one, uh, and the question that we suggest uh, would be um, uh, uh, whether you agree or disagree that health benefits of policies to slow down the spread of COVID-19 outweigh the economic costs of these actions. And uh, you will see a question on your screen if, and uh, you will be able to very quickly answer in 30 seconds. This is uh, not a very difficult one, so please, please go ahead. Um, okay, um, meanwhile, um, we've been uh, receiving questions uh, from uh, both uh, Zoom uh, 
participants, but also Facebook, you will not be surprised if I say that most of the questions were for um, Minister uh, Turnava. Um, but I think she uh, covered some of these um, most uh, many participants were interested on when the opening up will start, when the current regime is going to soften, because we have a, we are in a total lockdown right now, um, but also um, SME support schemes, um, tourism support schemes, uh, tax policies, etc. And I think she covered part of this. I think there are a few other questions that you may wish to reflect, um, uh, uh, um, Martin and Arup. Um, and let me read two, three of those questions and maybe you just reflect as, as you wish in one go. So uh, one of the questions was about OBOR, so the participant referred to OBOR, uh, but uh, meant BRI, um, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, One Belt, One Road. And, and the question was, Martin, that probably goes slightly more uh, relevant to, to, to where you stand, um, um, given uh, your, your status uh, in China. Um, whether uh, COVID uh, and pandemic will um, influence or derail uh, BRI, um, and I would really love to see uh, uh, what, what you think about it, but the question is not from me, it's from uh, other participants, so that would be very interesting to hear. Your reflections on Sweden's case, and um, uh, because Sweden uh, took a very different approach uh, to um, handling uh, the, the pandemic, right, avoiding lockdown and um, remaining opened up and so how do you see that it would impact in the long run right would they suffer because of that or would and and then economy would not be suffering as much as other economies so so if you could reflect on that balance um, there was one question about um, um, the fact that, uh, according to UN report and many others, um, I said also reflected on that a few days ago. Um, a COVID pandemic impacts are not gender neutral, um, and um, uh, particularly, um, um, you know, the household uh, labor um, and free work, um, increased free, free work for women. And if you wanted to reflect uh, on that, um, you know, from the standpoint of one of the countries, particularly. Um, so let's start with these three, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tamara. Thank you for the questions. Um, uh, I let Arup uh, talk about Sweden um, and uh, and maybe he uh, wearing his former hat as a uh, uh, as a social protection uh, uh, and uh, labor market uh, specialist in the bank. He may want to take the uh, distributional question on, on the gender impacts as well on the Belt and Road, um, uh, you know, um, the uh, the amount of Belt and Road financing has been declining as China's economy has been rebalancing. The current account uh, surplus, which was close to 10% of GDP in the early uh, part of the last decade, uh, has now declined to around uh, you know 2% of GDP. And so naturally, you know, there's less uh, money that uh, China uh, is exporting, and that was the case even before COVID. Um, whether the current crisis um, is going to lead uh, to uh, China rebalancing even further towards domestic demand. Um, there are some calls internationally for China to do so, because that obviously would help the world economy if China were starting to run current account deficits. Uh, given uh, you know, um, the size of its economy, that may be good for other emerging markets that could then import, uh, you know, export to, uh, to China. Um, but that's not entirely clear to me yet. Um, and I think from the point of view of, of, um, of the total size of this initiative, this matters. Now, when you look at um, the, the initiative itself, I think it has matured significantly. I think the initial initiative uh, was, was a name put over um, a very, um, uh, you know, not always very coordinated effort by Chinese companies to find business in other countries. And then they found a, a bracket, a political bracket, to try and coordinate some of these activities. Uh, and over time, I think um, it's become clearer that um, to achieve lasting development outcomes, which is the ambition of this initiative, um, 
the selection of projects, the analysis of their viability, um, the management of associated environmental and social risks, and the management of the debt capacity of the countries that are ultimately going to be asked uh, you know, to take on um, additional public sector debt to finance these projects needs to be brought much more into the focus um, of, um, of decision makers. And, and at the second Belt and Road Forum last year, uh, China made several policy announcements from greening the BRI to uh, the adoption of a debt sustainability framework that indicate uh, that China is going to look um, uh, you know, with, a, with, a, with a closer eye at some of these issues. Um, uh, how this plays out in individual country cases for individual projects is not something on which um, I, I can comment in detail. Uh, but I think it is desirable that China be more discerning about its foreign engagements. It would be uh, great if we can uh, you know, collectively work together, recipient countries, international financial organizations that know something about project finance um, and new development partners such as China to make sure that this initiative, which has so much potential you know, to improve um, uh, economic prospects through connectivity, uh, delivers on that, uh, on that objective. Um, and, and that's um, something that we've been, we've been trying to work on uh, with, our, with our Chinese uh, counterparts. I wanted to uh, say one more brief thing about one of the questions that I saw in the Q&A uh, window in Zoom which was, you know, people said, you know, emerging markets don't have endless amounts of money. Surely we need to prioritize. Who is going, who should we support? And I think that's, you know, that is perhaps the most difficult question because um, uh, it is such an unusual crisis uh, and the uncertainty is so large that um, on the firm side, it's clear that it's much too early to pick winners. Uh, at the same time, you can't extend support uh, indefinitely uh, you simply can't afford it, and 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 some structural change will be inevitable. So I I think at this stage, temporary support if you can afford it. But if you can't afford it, then you know from the World Bank's point of view, and I'd be keen to hear what Arup has to say because I don't think we in the World Bank have a you know have yet formulated a very clear sense of how to prioritize um, uh, in our dialogue with with uh, with our with our client countries. Uh, but it seems to me that you want to make sure that. Um, you avoid uh, a relapse into abject poverty um, by those that are most vulnerable. And I think having sound social protection systems in place that prevent that is a first step. Once you've got that in place, if you still have more money, then you can start thinking about temporary uh, support through you know, uh, wage subsidies to companies or tax breaks or other things. <clears throat> and if you then still have more money, then you can further expand. And, and, and obviously, to the extent that the international community can help, um, at the moment, I think there is a bias to trying to do more uh, rather than doing less simply because the effects are so uncertain. Uh, but there are clearly going to be trade-offs. There are clearly going to be limits. Um, and I'd be keen to hear what Arup has to say about this. Thank you. Thanks, Martin, for... Uh leaving me with the difficult questions <laughs> but, but uh, look, um, let me perhaps um, address the two other questions first um, rather briefly because I know that we are uh, running out of time now. In Sweden um, I think what is really really important to understand and underline is that Sweden has chosen a path. So let me give you some numbers to understand the choice that Sweden has made. Sweden right now has a death rate per million people of 136, 140, somewhere like that. Uh, Germany has 49, right? Um, Denmark has 58, uh, Norway has 30. So essentially what Sweden has chosen is that balance, that speed limit, that dial that says that one of the highest death rates in the world is worth it, if you'd like, and this is a social and societal choice, um, given the trade-offs, not so much of economics, but in terms of a uh, way of life, shall we say. Um, and this is saying that, not at all saying that people should be careless. This is saying that, please be, um, make sure you have social distance, 
please don't go to um, the office. Most people don't uh, go to the office. Please stay away from large gatherings and so on and so forth. Now, is this a choice that other countries can and should make? Um, some countries will have to do it by default, be blunt, because I think the costs of the lockdown for all the reasons we've talked about will become unbearable for some countries soon. And that's where one of the points that the minister made and that Martin made in his earlier remarks becomes important. That the lockdown is a time to prepare to um, all the capacities that you may not have had, especially in healthcare and social protection, in order to make sure that people are protected once inevitably. This will have to be lifted either once and for all or temporarily. And I think that's something that you see happening in Sweden, and I will predict, stick out my neck, will happen in other countries as well in Europe, is that these lockdowns will be cyclical at least uh, once more, if not again. In Sweden, what has happened is that the severity of the lockdown has increased over time as the initial expectation that this will not actually explode in Sweden has not been realized. So in Sweden, from gatherings where over 500 people were banned, now it is 50 people. From when um, the, uh, all shops were open to now where most non-essential shops are closed, to not realizing that this particular disease is most virulently spread, spread among the old and enclosed quarters, and therefore in Europe it is spreading mostly in old age homes and nursing homes where the tragedy is unbelievable because people, old people are in close quarters. So if one person is infected, the entire nursing home often becomes infected and many of these people die. So these are realizations, but these are trade-offs in the Swedish model. And I would just suggest that these are the trade-offs that need to be fully understood before people think about uh, opening up. On the gender, um, aspects of this. This, I think, uh, I very much um, agree with the broad story that the UN put out, is that we need to be aware and understand that this particular epidemic has differential effects on men and women. Uh, and often, in many cases, women are most disadvantaged. And without going into all the good analysis that is done in the report, I would agree on that and then reiterate, perhaps, um, Martin's point on then having adequate for the for now for the immediate period adequate social protection systems that actually can protect men and women alike but women most of all one of the particularly um, vulnerable groups in many countries but especially in countries like Georgia and in other parts of ECHA are older women living alone and for them there is this twin challenge of already being um, exposed to a higher poverty risk um, and also being vulnerable to the virus. There's also older women who, are, who may be affected or old women who may be affected if they are not the primary breadwinner in the family and the primary breadwinner is affected. Now you can't take a, a sort of scalpel to these sorts of issues. The way in this time to do is to strengthen the social protection system so that all such groups are uh, well covered. Finally, uh, the tough questions uh, around um, who to prioritize and when, and I fully agree obviously with what Martin is saying. And that's where perhaps my closing plea is that while in some ways this overall seminar was posed that what can we learn from China, Korea, and European, uh, Western European and European Union countries. Um, perhaps one closing remark is that perhaps we need to look at them, learn from their mistakes, but not try and take some of the steps that they have taken um, as lessons for ourselves, partly because in many countries across the world with um, who don't have the resources and who don't have the capacity, some of these measures are very, very hard to, to do. And therefore, each country will have to um, look at what can be done. And I absolutely agree with the hierarchy that Martin proposed. First and most importantly, it is important to protect the people. 
And that's where health, healthcare and social protection becomes very important. For the poorest countries, um, it's not just health. And we've learned this from the epidemics in Africa. It's not just health. It is actually life, lives are lost also because of food shortages and shortages of livelihood. And I think these are important uh, areas where Georgia, I, I think, has a wonderful social protection system that needs to be further strengthened and funded um, adequately. Second, for firms, um, the challenge becomes, um, in the, because it's a systemic shock, good and bad firms are affected equally. So a force of natural selection may not actually help. In fact, one of the dangers that many people are worrying about right now is that inefficient firms that are backed by the state may actually survive while viable firms, which are private, may not. And therefore, making sure that that sort of adverse selection where uh, inefficiency is not uh, rewarded beyond a certain point is going to be part of the restructuring process emerging out of it. And uh, given scarce fiscal resources, that is very important as well. Finally, and perhaps I'll end on a not so um, uplifting note, um, one of the concerns that many have is actually in terms of, given the fact that this is going to be, with all probability, a recession or a depression that lasts a long time, more than a year, uh, globally, um, only the fittest will survive. It may have an effect where large firms, um, large countries, and so on, will have the, will come out of it stronger. And then large companies can take over smaller ones, large countries can make the investments. And I think part of the role of the, of the international community, the global community, is also to prevent that sort of um, brutal adverse selection. And sometimes that may mean by taking measures that we in the World Bank would have thought unthinkable some time ago, uh, like state aid, um, which the European Union, for example, is permitting right now, or through broad scale social protection rather than targeted social protection. These are, this is a very unique crisis, and probably we need to look afresh at our orthodoxies and try and think about what this crisis needs, which may be something quite different. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Unfortunately, I don't think we have uh, time to uh, to go for more questions, but I, uh, I'm asking my colleagues to upload the results of our quick one question poll. Um, on the screen and I think you will have um, results on the screen so basically reminding you what the question was and what we see here uh, around 120 participants um, participated and in a view of um, 70 uh, 68% um, health benefits of policies to slow down the spread of COVID-19 outweighed economic costs of these actions and 68% either agrees or strongly agrees with this statement. So uh, thank you all uh, very much. Um, uh, uh, I'm not even going to try to summarize. I think this was a very rich exchange of experience of number of countries and what's going on and how various countries and regions or, and institutions are trying to deal uh, with impacts uh, of the crisis of pandemic. I just would reflect on a few points. I think uh, what uh, was highlighted um, 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 and I'm sort of taking it away is that um, we need to apply a lot of flexibility. In fact, uh, rapid learning, uh, processing of information and adapting to the new realities will be very critical and the word rapid would be um, a very key word uh, here. Um, another takeaway would be um, that we should expect structural changes uh, in economies and addressing these structural changes would require a lot of policy space but also um, a substantial administrative capacity. And I also heard several times of, uh, from, from our speakers um, uh, the reference to 
you know, um, uh, use lockdown to prepare, they use lockdown to get ready for the next steps and probably building up or organizing administrative capacity would be very key to addressing impacts of COVID and uh, post-COVID crisis. Um, and um, also another takeaway, we should probably expect behavioral changes behavioral changes of um, firms, but also individuals that was um, coming uh, from, from all uh, speakers and, uh, and um, um, uh, supporting, uh, you know, these adjustments and behavioral changes will be very critical, but also the meaning and importance of communication uh, to people in this period. So with this, uh, let me thank our participants for staying uh, with us uh, for, one hour and 55 minutes, but um, let me um, uh, uh, give our appreciation to Martin Reiser, to Arup Energy, who are senior officials of the World Bank for finding time in their busy schedules. You know, yes, we work from home, but uh, we all uh, are more or less, um, you know, busy, some more busy, some less busy, but uh, still. So thank you very much for finding time um, to share with us. And I also would like to thank Minister for her uh, rich reflections and wish all of us uh, good health and uh, good spirit. Thank you. Um, a last word would be that this is first in the series of uh, policy panels organized by ISET. And on ISET's behalf, let me mention that we will invite you to another one in 10 days' time. And the topic will be around education and impacts of COVID-19 um, in, in this sector. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you very much. Stay in Bye. Good health.